lymphatic system has um, three major functions. The first function is, is that it returns fluid that is lost from the capillaries. So it returns fluid lost from capillaries back to the circulatory vessels or just we'll put the circulatory system. And we're gonna talk more about that in a second. The second thing that it does is it provides a place where white blood cells can reside and where they can also reproduce. So this would be, this houses leukocytes. And so this is, um, those are uh, white blood cells that are capable of detecting infection. So this blood, this, or this, excuse me, this fluid that is transported back to the blood is filtered through a series of um, nodes that have leukocytes in them that can recognize foreign pathogens and that can reproduce and then and help to fight off um, infection. So this is the immune system. The third thing that it does is it transports fats that are absorbed from the small intestine. So the small intestine is the organ where most of the reabsorption takes place or the absorption takes place of nutrients but we don't want fats to go right into the circulatory system from there. And so they're kind of diluted in the lymph fluid as they are being transported. And then they get put back into the circulatory system after some dilution has occurred. So this would actually be a digestive function. So this would be the digestive function of the, um, of the lymphatic system, okay? So when we look at the lymphatic system, we can see that we have lymph vessels, or we'll just call them lymphatic vessels. And these lymphatic vessels are associated with capillaries. And in the books, in all the textbooks, these are green. So the lymphatic system is green, but you have to realize that it isn't really green, right? It's just this, that's the color that is designated for lymphatic vessels, okay? So the fluid that is picked up by the lymphatic vessels then becomes lymph. So this carries lymph. And it transports lymph. And the way that it picks it up is passive. So it passively uh, picks it up by an increase in hydrostatic pressure. So we have in the tissues, we have an increase in hydrostatic pressure. And so that would be like there's extra um, fluid in the tissues, right? And that provides a pressure which causes the lymphatic vessels to open. So this opens the vessel and fluid flows in. So one of the things about the lymphatic system is unlike the circulatory system, there is no pump. So the lymphatic tissue, the lymphatic fluid has to move in many cases against gravity that's coming from your feet, for example, um, against gravity and has to move back up to the neck region where it is put back into circulation. So we would say that the lymphatic vessels have no pump, but they do have valves. So like the veins, they have valves and this prevents backflow. Right? The other thing is, is that um, skeletal muscle contraction helps to move the lymph. 
So just like in veins, movement or exercise helps to move the, the lymph. It's um, sometimes if you uh, go do massages, if you get massages on a regular basis, you can sometimes see that some uh, people specialize in lymphatic massage. And so what that idea is, is that the lymph can become stagnant in body, in the parts of the body. And this is called lymph edema. So lymph edema is where we have swelling in the tissues because the lymph is not being removed properly. There's many different, um, uh, different causes of tissue swelling, and this is just one of them. So this is where the lymphatic system is not able to uh, pick up all the lymph that it should be able to pick up um, from that part of the body. So this is swelling in tissues due to blocked or damaged lymphatic vessels. So sometimes when people have surgery on parts of their body, sometimes the lymphatic vessels can be become damaged and then that could mean that they get swelling in that particular area. Okay. So if we look at this, these structures, this is a diagram from your book that shows the relationship between the lymphatic system and the circulatory system. So lymphatic system in green, right? You'll notice, interestingly, the lymphatic vessels are, have a end to them, but they're like a closed-ended vessel. It used to be thought prior to our examination of these vessels that they were actually like little vacuum cleaner hoses and open, you know, and they sucked, right? They sucked fluid. But now we know that they have a closed end, but they have these little valves that open up and allow the fluid to move into the vessel. So if we get a lot of fluid building up in the tissues, that hydrostatic pressure is actually going to cause this flap to open. And then the fluid is going to move into this vessel. And this, this vessel also has one-way valves. So that if the lymphatic uh, fluid gets above it, right, it's when it comes back down, it's, oops, did I draw that the wrong way? it the wrong way. Let's see. Lymphatic. Yeah, sorry. I drew the, my valves the wrong way. So it'd be like this. When it comes back down, it's actually going to close the valves, right? So it's kind of an amazing system being that there is no pump, okay? So if we look at a diagram of the lymphatic system, I'm going to hand you out a blank image here, and we're going to label it together. So we'll just do that front page first. So one of the things that you'll notice here is that the lymphatic system is like pervasive throughout the entire body. So it's found everywhere. Um, in the past, it was thought that the lymphatic system actually didn't go up into the brain. But like last year, if you were paying attention to the news, it was like big news because they were gonna have to redraw a lot of the, um, the diagrams. Because if we look at the diagrams of the lymphatic system as it is related to the brain, it looks something like this. We'll get back to that in a second. So this is the lymphatic system that is drawn in many textbooks, and it looks like this. And so even the one that is drawn in your textbook, is, it shows it coming up the sides of the head, right? But it doesn't actually show it coming up into the brain area. So it was quite amazing that, we, that um, people that were studying anatomy had missed the fact that the lymphatic system is also associated with the meninges of the brain, specifically the dura mater. And so they're going to have to re-go in and re-edit the textbooks because your textbook even says the lymphatic system does not, is not found in the central nervous system, and now we know that it is in the brain. 
So that would um, be important um, for um, immune function and the um, removal of excess fluid um, from the capillaries um, associated with the brain. Okay, so it is in the central um, nervous system. And I'm not sure about the, the spinal cord. Maybe they're looking for that too, to see if it's in the, the dura matter of the spinal cord as well. Okay, so um, what do you think the um, little bulbs here are referred to as? Anybody know? Nodes, right? So we're gonna talk about what these nodes are in a sec in a second. This region of the body is the groin, but in a technical terminology, what would you call it? What's, what's synonymous with groin? What's the region, the anatomical region? Um, close. It has kind of a funny region. It's a name, it's called the inguinal. Okay, so these are the inguinal, sorry, should I put lymph nodes? Those are the inguinal lymph nodes. How about the armpits? So sometimes when you get sick, like you get really sick, like maybe with the flu, you'll get swelling of the lymph nodes in the armpits, and that's called, the armpit region is called what? Axillary. axillary. So these are the axillary lymph nodes. And this is the neck region, so that would be the cervical lymph nodes. Now, um, we're gonna talk about the tonsils. The tonsils are not nodes, but sometimes when you get really sick, your neck will swell up, right? So, and they, they feel it and they say, is it tender, is it sore? And they're trying to determine whether or not those nodes are swollen in your neck, okay? And sometimes they can also be underneath your jaw and um, uh, salivary glands are also located underneath there, but sometimes the, the nodes can swell up underneath your jaw, okay? This, this image right here, this part of it, is just showing the lymphatic vessels. So one thing about the lymphatic vessels is they start off small, just like venules, and then remember the lymph is actually flowing back to the circulatory system, so they smart start up small and then they come together, right? So they combine into larger vessels. So one large region um, in your um, body is referred to as the um, thoracic duct. So that's this one right here. So that's the thoracic duct of the lymphatic system. Now your textbook says that about half of the people have an enlargement of the thoracic duct down low, and that is called the cisterna chile. Right. So only a half the individuals have that, so I'm not sure what the deal is with that. Right. But you'll notice that the thoracic duct is getting all of the lymphatic tissue or all the lymphatic fluid from the legs. Right, so it all comes up the thoracic duct. And we follow that thoracic duct up. It actually combines here where it comes into the right subclavian vein. And so this is where the um, thoracic duct, oops, this is the, oops, this is the thoracic duct, right? This, um, is the right subclavian uh, vein. All right, so that's that right there is the right subclavian vein. So there's a enlarged picture of it in a second. I'll show you. Now, um, so that actually, if you look at the where the, the vessels come, the right um, thor the thoracic duct entering the subclavian vein also carries lymphatic fluid from your right arm, okay? So remember, we're looking at this in anatomical position and you're like, well, why is that right when it's actually, um, is that right? Is that correct? Or is that left? It is left, isn't it? Yeah. I screwed up. 
somebody mumbling that that I screwed up? Is that the left? Okay. Okay, that's the left. Sorry. Left subclavian vein. It's a good thing I checked that, right? Okay. So um, this up here is what is referred to as the um, right lymphatic duct. Right here. The right lymphatic duct. Right? So the right arm and the right side of the head have their own vessel that gets transported into the right subclavian vein, right? So that would be the right subclavian vein. So the right lymphatic duct, you might want to write in there, enters the right subclavian vein. So enters. Okay. So is that the, um, I can't remember, is that the internal jugular or the external jugular? You don't need to know this one. Does that say, does it say in your book internal or external? Um, the one that's coming down right here, yeah. Internal. internal, okay. So you don't need to know those jugular veins, you just need to know the subclavian veins. Okay. Now sometimes you can get swelling of the nodes and um, that is not tender. So the nodes can swell for a reason. Okay. It could be due to infection, which is most common. And this is where we have the leukocytes, specifically macrophages. reproducing and fighting off pathogens. Okay. Now, another re thing that you can have is, is that you can have swelling of the nodes due to cancer of the white blood cells that are in the lymphatic system, and that is called lymphoma. Specifically, this is tender, so it hurts when those swell, and this tends to be not tender. So when you palpate them, for example, they're swollen, but they're not tender, right? And so this is cancer of white blood cells in the nodal tissue. Okay. And it's, it, um, there's two different types of lymphoma. One of them is called Hodgkin's lymphoma. And it is actually one of the most treatable forms of cancer. So um, I've known quite a few people that get Hodgkin's lymphoma when they're like in their 20s. And it's just so scary because somebody getting cancer in their 20s is really scary. But generally, the most common type of lymphoma is very treatable. And so it has a very, they have a really good prognosis of, of treatment and recovery from that. Okay. So this is just an enlargement of that image. And this is in your book too. Just showing where the vessels empty, the lymphatic vessels empty back into the circulation. And so everything that's in the lymphatic system eventually goes back to the, to the venous circulation. Okay, so let's talk about the cells and the tissues. So when we talk about lymphocytes, do you remember the two different types of lymphocytes that we um, have in our body? B cells and T cells. So B cells um, specifically are called B cells because they mature in the bone marrow.
They also are involved in the production of antibodies. So just like the antibodies that bind to red blood cells doing a transfusion reaction, um, the B cells would be responsible for the production of those antibodies, but also just the antibodies that are needed to protect the body from everyday um, invasion by bacteria um, or viruses or other things. Okay. The other types of T or cells are called the T cells. And they're called T cells because they are produced in the bone marrow, but they mature in the thymus gland. So the thymus gland is part of the lymphatic system, also part of the immune system. Kind of interrelated those two systems. So the thymus gland is located up in the neck region and it is, there's like two sides of it and then the thyroid sits in between those two parts of the thymus gland. Okay. These um, include, um, uh, what are referred to as cytotoxic cells, right? And these are cells that destroy other cells, including cancer cells and cells that have been infected with a virus. So those are the lymphocytes that are in the lymphatic tissue. We also have other white blood cells, specifically macrophages. And these are derived from monocytes. So monocytes can mature and produce macrophages and this can take place in the lymphatic system as the monocytes divide and then specialize. And macrophages are cells that eat bacteria and other cellular debris. We'll just put debris. So they eat cells, they eat bacteria. They eat actually um, break down um, old red blood cells in the spleen and those are the macrophages. So we can look at the tissues. And one tissue that is found almost in every single organ is a type of connective tissue, which is called reticular connective tissue. And this is the most abundant type of connective tissue in the body. And it's found um, in almost all organs, we'll put. And so really the lymphatic system as drawn is not complete because it's, it's in your skin, right? It's in, um, the di lining the digestive system, right, is in um, different parts of the body, not just the lymph nodes, okay? So if we look at a diagram of that reticular connective tissue, it looks like this. And so I don't remember, remember when we were looking at the reticular connective tissue, you can see um, that it is loose. So it has collagen fibers um, and that are actually has a special type of, of protein fibers that are form a network. So reticular means net. So it forms a network where the blood cells reside. So here you can see a macrophage um, and then you can see the lymphocytes. So you can sense this if you take your tongue and you rub it on the inside of your lips. So you can take it and go mm, eh, eh. Feel those little bumps and stuff in, inside of your lip. Eh. That is lymphatic tissue. Right, so that's in your skin. 
So that is um, uh, one type of tissue. Okay. So if we look at the um, lymphoid organs, um, this is, um, remember an organ is composed of many different um, types of tissue. And so we can talk about the, um, um, and I think, let me just make sure. I always get confused about the lymph nodes. I think those are considered organs. So I'm just gonna write them down here, lymph nodes. Okay, as one example. So in your book, there's a picture of a lymph node and it shows the flow of lymph in one direction through the um, node and then it also shows where the white blood cells reside. And so the lymph nodes actually have a filtering function. So notice that blood, excuse me, lymph comes in in this direction, right? And then there is a series of places where white blood cells um, reside, and then lymph flows out um, the kind of the opposite end of the of the node. So blood or lymph, excuse me, I keep saying blood, lymph comes in and then it goes out and it's filtered. So the lymph nodes function in filtering the lymph. Right. They filter the lymph. You do not need to know the different parts of the lymph node in this instance. Okay. Okay. We also have other organs. And this is what is drawn on your uh, handout. If you flip it over, the one that I gave you. Okay. So this is showing in this in this drawing. This is showing the red bone marrow. So you can label that the red bone marrow. What do you think this organ is right here? I just mentioned it. Um, the thymus. thymus. So what's not shown here is the thyroid gland, which would be right in the middle there. And how about this one right here? Spleen. Okay. And what are the ones that are located up in the mouth, oral cavity, pharynx region? What do you think those are? When we get sick, what gets sore in your throat? Tonsils, right? <laughs> so these are your tonsils. You actually have two different, or actually three different types of tonsils, okay? So this right here is the one, when you think about tonsils, that's the one you're thinking about. And that is what is called the palatine tonsil. And it could be a real pain, there's two of them, when you're um, a child, you know, they oftentimes they're like swollen, like chronically, so you get tonsillitis, right? And sometimes it becomes so bad that they get swollen and they close off and it actually becomes hard to breathe. So like I had, I had really bad tonsillitis when I was a kid, but then as you get older, you, that type of, that tissue actually shrinks, which is maybe not necessarily a good thing, because tonsils, we'll talk about, are really important in um, being the first line of defense for your respiratory system. But when people look in my throat, like doctors look in my throat, they say, oh, you had your tonsils taken out. And I'm like, no. They're like, well, they've shrunk so small that they're essentially non-existent, right? So the immune system, as you get older, shrinks. When you look at a cadaver of an old person, you might not even be able to find the thymus gland. It shrinks down. And that is a bad thing because then old people tend to get cancer and they can get pneumonia and they can get other problems um, associated with a weakened immune system. So that's kind of the problem with aging is that our immune system becomes weaker as we age, okay, in some extent. So this is actually on the back of the tongue so if you've ever been really sick in the back of your tongue, that's L, linguinal tonsil, becomes really irritated and red and sore, that's that tonsil. And then there's one up 
in your pharynx, which is called the pharyngeal tonsil. This has another name. Does anybody know what it's called? This is called the adenoid. So when people talk about their adenoids and being swollen, right, they're talking about the tonsil that's at the root, at the inside their pharynx. Okay. So this is looking at it from an anterior view. If you looked at it from a side view, it would look something like this, right? So again, this is your pharyngeal tonsil. This would be your palatine because it's near the palatine bone, which makes up the roof of your mouth, right? And then this would be your lingual tonsil, which is on the very, very back surface of the tongue. The tonsils themselves are part of what is called malt. So there's a system in the lymphatic or a part of the lymphatic system which is called malt. And malt stands for mucus, mucus, if I can spell that, mucus associated lymphatic tissue. So whenever we have lymphatic tissue near the mucous membrane, which would be like the back of your throat, it's mucousy, right? Produces mucus in response to filter out um, microorganisms and also to help with fight off infection, right? Now there's another part of the mucus associated lymphatic tissue that is inside your um, intestines. So if you go back to that previous, this is what is called pyres, patches. So that's a name of a person that discovered them. And they are in the distal part of the small intestine. So we do have some bacteria that can make it through, you know, the acid environment of the stomach and get into the small intestine. And so this would be to help fight off infection in the small intestine. So those are the Peyer's patches. That's an R. Peyer, P-E-Y-E-R, patches. Now, what is this structure right here? It's a little finger-like projection off of the large intestine, which the first part of the large intestine, which is called the cecum. Does anybody know? Sometimes it gets inflamed and you have to have it removed. Appendix. appendix. So the appendix is located off of the cecum. And when we get to the digestive tract, this is the first part of the large intestine. And the large intestine has good bacteria in it. And the bacteria, the good bacteria actually reside in the cecum. So, um, and that actually, we'll talk about that. Those, those good bacteria actually help to break down food and produce vitamins. Um, but sometimes you get a bad bacteria in your large intestine and it can um, pose a big problem because it can lead to diarrheal diseases. And we'll talk more about that when we get to the um, digestive tract, okay? So this is the appendix. Sometimes the appendix gets inflamed itself. And if it ruptures, then you get all kinds of really bad things getting into your body cavity. And you have to go in there and quickly flush out the body cavity and try to remove the bad microorganisms before you um, become so septic that you can die from that. Okay, so it's really dangerous to have the appendix actually rupture. Okay. Okay. Um, 
Oh, so some diseases that you might have heard of. Um, one is the bubonic plague. Now, the bubonic plague doesn't occur very frequently these days, thank goodness, because we have antibiotics to fight it off. But in the 1300s in um, medieval um, Europe, it ended, actually ended up killing like one third of the entire population. So 33% of the entire population died from it. And so it is actually caused by a bacterial infection um, that is in the lymph nodes. And so the thing about this bacteria is, is that the macrophages cannot eat them. So for some reason, the macrophages are unable to eat the bacteria. And even I read that the macrophages can engulf the bacteria, but the bacteria are so resistant that they can actually reproduce themselves inside of the white blood cell, the macrophage, and cause the macrophage to burst. So essentially they could kill the macrophages, okay? And so they cause um, swelling in different parts of the, of the area. So this would be in the neck region, but also in the groin and your armpits. And then the, the lymph nodes can actually um, burst and rupture and they can cause damage to the um, tissue, which leads to pus and blood. And then what happens, because it's sometimes referred to as the black plague, is it causes um, tissue death. And so when the tissues die, they turn black. And so that's why the bubonic plague is called the black death, okay? So the buboes are actually just swollen, swollen lymph nodes, okay? Okay, so let's look at the spleen in a little bit more detail. So I mentioned that the spleen houses red blood cells, and also platelets. And that's really important function if platelets are needed for blood clotting. The spleen also breaks down old red blood cells. So remember that the spleen is located in the abdominal cavity near the stomach. And um, it's kind of interesting because sometimes the spleen um, can, can become damaged. So for example, if you get kicked or if you're in an accident, like a car accident, the spleen can become damaged and it can actually um, cause hemorrhaging. So when you damage the spleen, like you crush it, it causes blood to move out into the tissues and it causes internal bleeding quite a bit because that's where the old red blood cells go to be broken down. Um, it's kind of interesting because recently they discovered that the spleen can repair itself. Um, so generally they do not like taking it out. And in children and young adults, um, if there's just a little bit of spleen left, it can actually regenerate itself and produce a whole new organ. So it has um, regenerative proper properties. Okay. It also filters um, microorganisms. So it does have an immune function. So there are macrophages located in the spleen. And in fact, when you look at a, um, an image of the spleen, they have what is referred to as the red pulp. Okay, so this would be erythrocyte breakdown. So that's what's occurring in the red pulp. The white pulp is where we have leukocytes. So the leukocytes are protecting the, um, um, the spleen from infection and also filtering. So blood comes there, right, where the red blood cells are broken down. And so it helps in the immune function. So if we look at a diagram of the spleen, you don't need to know um, any uh, in parts of this image, but you can see that when you cut it open, you have the red pulp right here, 
So that would be where the red blood cells are residing. And then the white part is where the white blood cells reside. And then when you look at a slide image of it, it doesn't really stain red and white, but the white pulp is kind of embedded in the red pulp <coughs> of that tissue. So there's two different parts of the organ when we look at it histologically, and it's based upon the two, two major functions is breaking down of red blood cells, and then also the um, white cell and um, protecting against infection. Okay, we already talked about malt. Okay, so um, I, I don't know why I have this image right here, but this is um, showing um, a tonsil. So remember the tonsils are part of the malt. And one really interesting thing about the tonsils is, is that they have crypts in them. So we can talk about tonsillar crypts. Okay. And the crypts actually function to capture bacteria. So this is actually the first line of defense for the respiratory system. Which is why when I was a child, they stopped just taking the tonsils out of everybody, right? It used to be you just, if you had sore throats all the time, they'd be like, oh, well, let's just take your tonsils out and then you won't have sore throats anymore. And um, but then they all of a sudden they realize, oh, well, if we take their tonsils out, maybe bacteria will get into their lungs and then maybe they'll be more likely to get infection in the lung like pneumonia, right? So then they tried to, um, to stop um, uh, doing that, taking the tonsils out just on you know, an usual basis. Has anybody here had their tonsils removed? And was it because you had, they were so swollen, you couldn't swallow or breathe or they were swollen all the time? Yeah, so some people have like their tonsils are swollen all the time. Now, one problem with um, these crypts is, is that sometimes they can capture food and bacteria, and then you can get what are called tonsil lists. Okay, so these are tonsil or tonsil, how do you spell that? Tonsil, I think it's tonsil lists. This is tonsil stones. So lists are stones, right? And so this is food um, that um, uh, gets trapped in, and bacteria get in there, and then it's it's kind of decaying in there. And sometimes it can get actually really hard. And so people with tonsil stones um, typically have problems. Their tonsils get sore, they get swollen. And what you have to do is you have to go in and just kind of uh, squeeze on it using like maybe um, uh, uh, um, what could you use a swab like an ear swab right you could stick that down your throat and you squeeze on it and then they pop out right and they can be real hard and they can become calcified since hence they can become what are called tonsil stones okay so unfortunately my 15 year old has chronic tonsil stones um, and so she's begging me to let her get her tonsils taken out. But it's kind of a last resort for people with tonsil stones to get their tonsils taken out. So I'm trying to avoid, I try to tell her that it's gonna be painful to have her tonsils taken out. Anyway, okay, so those are tonsil stones. This is a diagram of the small intestine. And so what we're seeing here is, is that these little lumps right here are part of that malt and these are called the um, Peyer's patches. So remember in, this is the ileum, the small part of the intestine called the ileum, and those are the Peyer patches. And so those are also um, part of the lymphatic system. Okay, so that's it for the lymphatic system. So I'm gonna stop there for today. We're gonna to talk about more about the immune system on Wednesday. So you want to just drop off your clippers, okay, right here.